Please pray with me. God, we ask that you open to us your word this day, that in hearing we may understand, and in understanding we may come to believe more deeply in your wisdom for how you would have us live. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture passage for this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9. Let us listen together. Matthew writes, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is the word of the Lord. There once was a man who had given much thought to what he wanted from life. He had experienced many moods and trials. He had experimented with different ways of living, and he had had both his share of success and failure. But at last, the man began to see clearly where he wanted to go. So diligently, the man searched for the right opportunity. Sometimes he came close only to be pushed away. Often he applied all his strength and imagination only to find the path hopelessly blocked. But then, at last, the opportunity came. But the opportunity would not wait. It would only be made available for a short time. If it were seen that the man was not committed, the opportunity would not come again. So eager to take this opportunity, the man started on his journey. And with each step, he wanted to move faster. And strength that had left him since his early youth returned. Hurrying along, the man came upon a bridge that crossed through the middle of town. It had been built high above a river. The man started to cross, and as he did, he noticed way off in the distance someone coming from the opposite direction. As the person moved closer, it seemed as though they were coming to greet him. But the man could tell that he did not know this other person. As the person drew closer to the man, he could see that they also had something tied around their waist, a rope. It had been wrapped around their waist many times, and if extended, it would likely be close to 30 feet long. As the person approached the man, they began to uncurl the rope, and just as they were close enough to reach out a hand, the person instead offered the man the end of the rope. Pardon me, the person said. Would you be so kind as to hold on to the end of this for a moment? Surprised, the man agreed without a thought, and he took the end of the rope. Thank you, the person said. With two hands now, remember, hold on tight. And then the person jumped off the side of the bridge. Instinctively, as the person's body began to free fall, the man braced himself against the side of the bridge and 
looking over down at the person now dangling close to oblivion, he said, what are you trying to do? Just hold tight, the person said. I'm helpless. And if you let go, I am lost. This story comes from a book of fables written by the rabbi Edwin Friedman. Like all fables or parables, this story is meant to convey a deeper message beyond just the initial simplicity of the story. And this story of a man being asked to deter his life's goals in order to help a person who jumped off a bridge is, even though it does not at first appear that way, a story about compassion and what it does and does not ask of us. As we are exploring various feelings this summer and attempting to learn from scripture how to manage and work with them, there was no way that we could not spend a week on compassion as it is one of the central feelings in scripture, both as it is demonstrated in the life of Christ and as it is commanded of us. But in order to talk about compassion, we also need to talk about empathy, one of the buzziest buzzwords in our society today. Compassion and empathy often get conflated typically with people thinking that compassion is the same thing as empathy, but it's not. So to understand why, let's first spend a moment focusing on empathy, which is defined as being able to feel with someone. To be empathetic is to put yourself in another person's shoes emotionally. It is to feel the pain or the sadness or the joy or the fear of another person as they are feeling it. And in theory, this sounds like a good idea. It sounds like a way to become more kind, more sensitive, more attuned, and thus more responsive to others. Because of this, people are often encouraged to be more empathetic, both in their personal lives, but also in the workplace as well. CEOs and other industry leaders increasingly list empathy as a top trait for those who want to excel in the workplace as good managers. And someone in the tech world recently told me that engineers at Google are working to create artificial intelligence that will make our computers more empathetic. At some point in the future, our laptops may be able to mimic our own emotional state back to us. And I'll let you decide if that's a good idea or not. And yet, despite the prominence of empathy in this cultural moment we find ourselves in, not everyone thinks that it's as good as it sounds. Neuroscientists and psychologists have spent a fair amount of time examining what happens to the brain when it is in a state of empathy, and in a somewhat surprising discovery, they noticed from fMRI scans that when people were told to feel empathetic, the parts of their brain related to distress exhaustion, and burnout were activated, which overall made them less helpful to the person that they may have been trying to help. I have seen this before in my work. A couple of years ago, tragedy st struck a friend of mine, and as typically happens, people began to gather around her and her home quickly filled with family and other friends and many of her neighbors were coming by. 
I was sitting on the couch in the living room with my friend when one of her neighbors came in. This neighbor was well-intentioned, but she had so identified with the pain and the sorrow that my friend was feeling that she had become emotionally overwrought and was incapable of being present to my friend's actual feelings. And in all of that emotion, my friend actually started to respond to her neighbor's distress by trying to comfort her. Of course, not everyone demonstrates empathy to that extreme, but that is what empathy does to all of us on some level. And that is why empathy, despite its good intentions, may not be the best approach. In contrast, compassion does not mirror the other person's anguish. Compassion does not need to feel what another person feels, but rather responds to another person's pain because responding is the right thing to do. One way to think of it is that empathy focuses on emotion while compassion focuses on principle. That does not mean compassion is only a thinking response and that we do not also feel compassionate, but compassion, again, based on brain scans, feels very different than empathy. Whereas empathy feels whatever another is feeling, compassion feels warm. Positive feelings towards someone in need, regardless of how that need is presenting itself. It's almost like with empathy, we become one with another person. And with compassion, we remain separate, but no less caring and concerned. And our text for this morning illustrates the difference between these two emotions well, although I don't think that was its original intent, but is more a product of its translation. In verse 36 of our text, the English translation reads, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless. But in the original Greek, verse 36 reads, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were wearied and cast away. Now, the difference there is slight, but it's still significant particularly as it relates to the words helpless versus cast away. People who are cast our way are not in a good situation, but they may also not be helpless. To be helpless implies a loss of personal agency, and very rarely are people truly helpless. To be helpless is to be physically limited by accident or illness or to be without one's ability to think and reason. That description does not fit the crowd that followed Jesus. They had their difficulties and trials like everyone else, but they weren't helpless. So why translate it that way? Maybe it was to elicit empathy. Maybe the translators thought that readers of scripture hundreds of years in the future would be more likely to feel for the crowd if they were helpless, as opposed to just cast away. And maybe the translators too were conflating empathy with compassion. It's impossible to say for sure, but the discrepancy in translation raises the question. And it also requires that we think carefully about what it means when the text says that Jesus had compassion 
and what that means for how we should practice it. Because Jesus did care for people, there can be no question about that. He healed, he taught, and in his three years of ministry, he saw more suffering than most people see in a lifetime. But it never consumed him. Because he practiced being present without being overtaken. Another way to say it is that Jesus was able to stand with another in pain, but he did not stand in their pain. He was compassionate, but not empathetic. Because the danger with empathy, as opposed to compassion, is that we run the risk of making both ourselves and another helpless, so to speak. As Friedman's fable illustrates, with empathy, we run the risk of holding on to a rope that we could never let go. We are called to be compassionate. The harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. There is no shortage of circumstances in which the opportunity for us to care for others presents itself. But the challenge of compassion is to determine how we care for others without giving away ourselves. How do we help in a way that does not see the other as helpless? How do we help in a way that does not render us helpless? When a person walks up to us on a bridge and hands us a rope, do we take it or not? And if we do, how long do we hold on? 